So today we're going to be knocking out some more of our rapid deployment kits. But here I am at Parsons and I'm looking back at it now and thinking about how far we've come with our monitoring units. Now this is from early on, early on in the piece. Right, there's one of my bulls over there. One of my blue tag boys. Uh, so back on track. This is from early on when we were putting in monitoring units. That's one of my earliest sort of models. Uh, it's, it's a small panel. It's made out of stuff off eBay and from an electronic supply store. It's kind of amazing to think how far we've come and in such a short amount of time. It's just good to know now we're getting them to a, a point where we can get them get them out and in place and on the system really quickly. Great to have a look back at the past and see where we came from and where we're going to. All right, we're gonna get over to Lyle Brown now. Ant and Dad are in the truck. Ant's getting a bit of an intro to that. And we'll get on our way and get these other points up and running today. From where I'm, from the middle of this shuttle, North is... North there. Am I on it, Ant? You're on it. Geology with Ant. It's a rock. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's actually so that see you got the that's quartz. Mm -hmm. So they're so they're quartz inclusions, but it, it, this like whenever you get rocks, right? Ant hammer. You gotta get ant hammer because they're all weathered on the outside. Well, yeah, so these ones here. Are. It's good to have a look on the inside because they all of this stuff here gets so weathered. Yeah, that's not gold, is it? No, no, it's, <laughs> it's not. But it's probably, looks to me like a chert. Yeah. So you get a lot of chert, which is actually a sedimentary rock. Well, we get a lot of chert when we're drilling out here. Yeah, you do, because it's a, it's a very fine grained sedimentary rock and you get it in banded iron formation, biff. Yeah. So you get this interlaid with your iron. Yeah, so I, I think it's a chert, I think. But you know, I'm no I'm no I'm no geologist. <laughs> <laughs> because it's such harsh weathering out here and anywhere you go really, even the most experienced geologists, if you go to them and say, What's that? Most rocks they, they that's why they have the geology hammer, so they can they can sort of chip it away and get past the weathering zone to look at the actual mineralogy and the and the grain size and the orientation all that so they know what's going on. Right, so that's Lyle Brown done. That didn't take us too long. I think we're getting pretty quick at this now. It's good to have comms down here. It's pretty awesome. We're launching from here at Lyle Brown, up on top of Parsons Bluff itself. And then that's going all the way up to Dusty Tower or Jump Up, and then to Virgins, and then to the Homestead. So it's doing somewhere around 5, 30, 7, around 45 kilometers. So that's a pretty good effort. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Tracking well. So here we are, we're at Camel Bore. Or at least I am, was one of the deepest bores on the property. 
at 120 feet or 33 meters. So back in the day when you had windmills out here, they didn't really like to go too deep because it was a lot of effort to pull them back up. But now we have some bores around here, which are around 46 meters. So we've got a little bit more depth and ability because of the electric pumps. The electric submersible pumps are a lot easier to pull by hand and by yourself. Camel yards here, the trees perished, but we've got a leak in the trough. That's a little bit of a repair job that Ant and I'll have to get onto using a compound that we've got. Camel bore, it's uh, out on the edge. In the book, it actually just has for, you know, where it got its name, just says obvious. This is one of our last bores out on the southeast quarter of the station. So we're below the top part of Lake Wells at the moment. Now over here, we did have a small issue with say supply. So we've actually gone for a dual angle on our solar panels. And what that does is it gives us a lot of the early morning and then into the evening because this area did have a lot of stock on it. We've also got a nice full tank there. And that's one of our larger types of tanks. And it's got its dipstick, which is nice and obvious. Now its signal is a cable run under and it's a physical float valve. This one's not running a pressure switch. And so we lift our tanks up just a little bit to make sure that they've got enough head pressure to always keep the trough full. Are you okay for me to climb? Yeah, I'm just gonna put one around here. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm happy with that connection. You are? Yeah, 30 and 50. So 30 down, 50 up is... is Speedy Gonzales. So I can see all of the yards. Yeah. I can see the bore and I can see the tank. I can't see the solar panels though, but is that happy enough? Look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to point it down a little bit more because I don't want so much sunlight in it. been dealing with livestock practically all my life through granddad and dad it was well established without water you don't have stock behind stock is fodder 
So the first bit I keep ramping about is there are five really important things in a station. It's water, 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 and water. Then what follows behind with the setup that we've got here now is we can see from the homestead what is going into our yards and we can see any feral that are coming. And that's really important because then we can start working on the sixth important thing, fodder. With that, uh, being able to see with the trap yards, you're keeping the water protected for the cattle and you're keeping the ferals out, which in some instances makes them move on at the camel. Uh, with horse and donkey, it lets us know we can see if they've come in we can then make a control program and take that out, take, remove the, those ferals so, so that we don't have impact on the, the sixth important, the feed. And when we get the whole property done, it means that Jack can go away and have a break. Ant can look at the cameras, see where there's an issue, go out and and attend to it if need be. If he can't, then he can call someone. And then that's day one. That's just day one. Because by day two, one of us could be up to help from aspirants or whatever. So if you're only checking your water points twice a week, you could have them out of water for three days. So this really lifts the animal welfare up to a high level. Not driving around or flying around. We are minimizing or cutting down our, our carbon, so we're, we're heading rapidly towards being carbon neutral. I think it's just wonderful. The difficulty for me is that in certain spheres, it hasn't been recognised the value of this work. And having been involved in R&D work in the industrial mineral sector for a significant number of years, the cost of being at the front is three times what it is for a follower because you implement something and it's not right. So you've got to have the courage to, to either borrow the money or just stick your neck right out and get it right. We're now in like phase three, four of the, uh, the cameras and we're getting pretty close to what will be very good. And you hear a lot of banter uh, going on but that banter is development work, believe it or not, but it's serious interrogation of an idea. Without that, you, you can't get to the next level. And it's just got to be interrogated without fear or favour. You've got to be able to make a comment, and it's just great. It's just wonderful working all together. I think just on that point around courage, ideas, you know, ones have an idea, and to be creative, but the courage is the next step and the, you know, if, you've, if you believe in it, you've got to go for it. And um, you guys definitely do that, we, we the people. And in the previous industry I was in, there was a guy, I won't mention his name or the company he's from, but he was, he was good. And when we were looking to further the science or improve on all of the productivity and efficiency and all those sorts of things. He had this mantra and he used to say, think big, prototype small, mm. and then fail fast or scale fast. I think that, that's a great model because we, you know, thinking big around a, a pastoral place like this is, imagine running a pastoral station, you didn't have to move from your lounge room. I mean, not that you'd ever want to do that, just throw something out there, throw something. And then prototype small. Okay, what are the things we need to do? We have to have to see the water. We've got to be able to communicate with each other. We've got to be able to... And so you prototype small, exactly what you've been doing around the station. And then, and then you either fail fast, you say, look, it doesn't work, move on to the next thing. Or you scale fast. And so we've been to the prototype, and yes, it's a continuous improvement process, but we are at the point now where when I first came here, you said, okay, of the 38 wells or whatever, we've done about you know, eight or whatever, and we're almost up to double that now yep. because you've got a we've got a concept that that works. It's been proven, proof of concept, and now we'll scale fast. We'll get the we'll get, and then we'll continuously improve on that model so that ultimately 
you have a connected station, you know, you have consistency in the thing. So if one breaks down, then you can think, and then you just keep on, you just keep on improving as technology improves, we keep on improving. Yeah, yeah, no, too right. And with the, so with the, the trap yards, we rolled those trap yards out in the first year. We did our first muster with the trap yards. Wow. And with trap yards, you've got to have the whole property set up mm. to trap yards. Mm. If you've only got part of it, what mm. happens is all you do is move stock onto the next water point that doesn't happen because they don't like going in to start with until they're well trained up. Mm. They don't like going in. But you'll see now, even with, we've seen them where there's been water outside and they'll bump their way through and go into the yards. They're that used to it. They've been going in since they're little fellas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you said exactly, Ant, well, with it, we, we only roll these cameras out as quick as we can get them now. And then we've got the whole place done. And first thing in the morning, you can take 10 minutes, have a look and see if there's ink. Or if you want to, uh, like I like to do at night, just before I go to sleep, I go and I just roll it back and look and yep, all good. And then I go to sleep you know. and I am so relaxed because mm. I know that every animal has access to water on the property. And I also know that we haven't got uh, a heap of ferals non-contributing shareholders taking some of the profit away. And so we're there then set up. And the other big thing that comes in is, is drought. Now, drought up here, I'm not sure about how, how you classify drought. What I know is that we are in an area that will have deficient rain periods. Mm -hmm. And to be able to react to them quickly is key to, to retaining your business. We could muster the whole of the property in the warm time in sub two weeks. Yeah, right. Sub two weeks. All we do is we set, we just pull in, roll every cow onto the on, onto the truck. We just drive from one point yeah, with the yard, yeah, set yeah. the next one. When I say from the yard, there's the yard, mm -hmm. drives the next one, back it up to the out gate, mm -hmm. drop them in, pff, on you go. And that way, in a dry period, you can get cattle out while they've still got enough condition to transport. Mm -hmm.